Invasive species like cokey frogs, little fire ants, and the rhinoceros beetle have been described as the single greatest threat to Hawaii's economy, natural environment, and the health of our communities. These invaders are tough and costly to control. What can you do to help fight these menaces? Join the conversation with those on the front lines of Hawaii's battle against invasive species. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. The Hawaii State Legislature identified invasive species as the single greatest threat to the economy, natural environment, and health of our community. Hawaii residents are well acquainted with many of these nuisances, like the little fire ant, koki frog, rapid ohia death, and ringed parakeet. But threats to our island's well being come from a variety of less notorious plants, animals, microbes, and pathogens as well. These invasive species wreak havoc on our delicate ecosystems, cause millions of dollars in damage to property and crops, and cost the state millions to control. Tonight we will talk to experts throughout the state who are actively involved in the ongoing battle against these destructive pests and learn what we as community members can do to help limit their impact. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call with your questions and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Christy Martin is the spokesperson for the Coordinating Group on Alien Pest Species, or CGAPS, a partnership of government agencies and non-government organizations working to strengthen Hawaii's biosecurity program. Tiffany Kayanini is the project manager for Kauai Invasive Species Committee. She works closely with the community to raise awareness on the impact of invasive species and strengthen KISC partnerships across the island. Michael Meltzer is an associate researcher in the Agricultural Security in the University of Hawaii's Department of Plant and Environmental Protection Sciences. His program is working to develop and implement ways to eradicate Hawaii's invasive species. And Suzanne Case was appointed chair of Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources in 2015. She oversees the maintenance, conservation, and preservation of all of the state of Hawaii's public lands. She's also the co-chair of the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. Thank you all for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. This is such an important issue for basically anyone who lives here in Hawaii. Michael, I want to start with you. Let's talk about what we're talking about when we discuss an invasive species. How do you define that? Well, an invasive species is basically anything that's, that's non-native to a particular ecosystem. So it's either been introduced, uh, there's several different pathways for introduction, but most of them these days are, are human vectored, usually through trade or transport of some sort. And uh, the, the invasiveness the, just sort of depends on your biology. And, and uh, the most invasives are ones that don't have natural uh, predation or parasitism or, or pathogens in their new environment. And so they, they more or less uh, reproduce unchecked and, and can uh, wreak havoc. Uh, if it's, the climate is right and the conditions are correct, they can, they can expand to, to rather large populations in a short period of time. And Tiffany, Christy, I want to ask both of you, Tiffany, we'll start with you. What do you think are the biggest threats to our ecosystem today when we're talking about invasive species? It depends who you ask. <laughs> um, there's threats that can impact our ecology and our native biodiversity and our natural resources, like Baptohia death. There's also ones that can affect us, um, like koki frogs that you're probably familiar with on Big Island or little fire ants that affect um, agriculture. It depends what sector you're really invested in, in which one's the largest ones that's going to be impacting us in our community in Hawaii. Christy, I'd like to ask you the same question. What do you see as the biggest threat to our ecosystem right now? Well, for islands like Hawaii, uh, the biggest driver of extinctions is invasive species. And that could be anything from, you know, just plants, uh, invasive plants like strawberry guava, um, that are just relentless in their ability to invade and take over. Um, that's going to take over uh, the a lot of native forests and convert it into a, a monotypic one species forest. So when people ask me that question, they're asking for something rather exotic and exciting. And I hate to say, well, it's probably just the weed in your backyard that's really 
um, one of the most harmful that we can see. Um, not exciting, but there you go. Well, it's inter interesting to me that you identify strawberry guava because, you know, you go out for a hike and you pick a few and you eat them and they're now integrated into our food system. They're part of our local culture. Um, so it, it sounds in some cases it's things that we don't even really think of as invasive um, because they in some cases can be somewhat pleasant. Sure, it, it was brought so long ago, the um, 1800s, and it has become part of our culture. You know, we are used to it, uh, but it is um, very successful. It was moved here without its natural predators. You know, in its home range, it's actually really rather difficult to find because its natural predators, the, the, the parasites that live in its leaves and, and things like that, um, keep it in check. And, and so when it was brought here, you know, you don't, you don't bring the really nasty looking plant, you bring the one that's healthy. So when it was brought here, it was brought without all of those natural enemies, you know, as Mike was saying. And, and so it has very successfully outcompeted um, really healthy Ohia forests that, you know, we don't just depend on Ohia forests for water, but the culture depends on it too. So yes, um, strawberry guava is a, a recent cultural um, uh, uh, valued plant for some folks, but for others, um, they really depend on the native species uh, that have been here for, for a long time. And of course, the ecosystem depends on having those ohia there. You know, Suzanne, in that introductory video, we saw the fire ants. We, you know, talked about koki. There, there's, of course, the algae in the ocean, and then there's the rapid ohia death. There's so many species on such a variety of levels. Where is the state focusing their efforts right now? Because surely it's difficult to battle any one of these on its own, but taken as a whole, it, it must be just too much. Certainly, uh, and that's a that's a really good example of there. There are so many invasive species that. You know, once they get here, they you, you don't really know um, what you're missing until it gets here, and then it gets it gets here. And if it get, if it escapes and gets out into the environment, the native ecosystems, agriculture, the human environment, um, it can be very very devastating. So, um, I like to think of it as sort of three tiered um, prevention is the most important thing to keep. There's so many so many invasive species out there that we want to prevent them from coming here, and then. The second level is uh, uh, early detection and rapid response. So you want to, as soon as you see something and you can identify it uh, before it spreads, you want to just tackle it right away. And that's why you see sort of all hands on deck when you when you see a new infestation, either from outside Hawaii or transferring inner island. It, it's really all hands on deck because then the once you get past that, if it escapes into the uh, environment, natural or human environment, then you're into control stage and it's much more difficult to control at that stage so i would say i mean we're focused on on all of those levels and um um but but it, it's really important to get it uh as early as possible and prevent it uh if at all possible yeah from tiffany coming in. tiffany brought up the koki frogs on hawaii island and you know a number of years ago they were really just in certain pockets of the big island not throughout but basically they're everywhere there now and it, it's kind of just part of the landscape do you expect that that will be true for the rest of the state suzanne well, we, i'll start with we you hope on not. that we, we 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 hope not i mean so the 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 uh i think there's two ways something can come in one is intentionally and one is accidentally and that can happen again either in inner island or from outside hawaii so it makes it really important. A, a lot of these things have come in intentionally. The strawberry guava is a, a great example of that. But the koki came in, uh, hopefully, accidentally. I, although some some think maybe maybe it was brought in intentionally. But um, I think everybody knows the harm it creates now, and um, th they really can. They just they just the hop a ride on on plants generally uh, coming inner island, and and it's it's. It's really important to have inspection systems uh, to 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 be on the watch for you know plants once they get here in in the nurseries before they get distributed. Same with fire ants. Um, it, it's it's just really important to keep an eye on um, all stages of that potential transport. Tiffany, I know you're joining us from Kauai tonight. Can you tell us what is something unique to your island that you're facing there? Um. 
rose ring parakeets is one, I guess, if you want to jump into that one. Um, there are rose ring parakeet populations on other islands, but they're not as densely populated. So the rose ring parakeets on Kauai, interesting enough, um, it's thought to believe to come from just a few that were released intentionally or accidentally in the 1960s. Um, over, they had a small population over the next few decades, and then in the early 2000s, exponential growth, about 20 or about 10,000 is estimated in 2020. Um, and so then the impacts that they have are agricultural impacts. They affect our large scale agricultures, our backyard growers, food growers. And what's being done to, you know, when you're talking about a population that size, you surely can't trap them all. So what is being done to try to, you know, control this population? Right. Um, well, this one's a good example of partnership effort. It's a multi-agency collaborative effort. We have federal, state, county, private, nonprofit, and for-profit entities working together to come up with a plan that can be long-term and sustainable um, to reduce the population down. This plan hopefully will be developed um, at the end of this year or early 2022 and come up with different techniques that we can use to control it at different levels within the island, across the island. You know, Michael, when we're trying to figure out how to control these populations, I think that, you know, the koki is a good example on, on one island that obviously couldn't do it. And, and a lot of that has to do with just the geography of that place, right? That there is so much, uh, there, there's so many, river, you know, valleys and lush places for a population that like that to grow. Given how, you know, lush and welcoming our ecosystem is, how do we uh, mitigate these pests? Yeah, that's, that's the million dollar question right there. And, and if you look at studies, the climate similarity from the origin to the, the where the, you know, to Hawaii basically is, is usually the biggest linkage uh, for an invasive species establishment. And, and unfortunately we do have that great environment from a lot of tropical locations. Uh, I, I think how we stop it is, is uh, you know, we're getting better and better technologies um, for, for detecting things initially. Um, uh, our lab, for example, we're, we're, we're uh, focused more on diagnostics, I guess, and we're, we're looking at the little things. I, I think we've generally been okay at looking for some of the big things, and one of the things we do is look for the little things, the microbes that you can't just see visually, uh, developing the diagnostics for them. And so that's a large focus of, of what we do. So we're trying to help a little bit in that way on, on preventing some of the, say, the bacteria, the viruses, the fungi, and, and stuff coming in. Uh, but you know, there, there are tools coming available. The, you know, I think that we're getting more and more focus on invasive species in the fight uh, and the mitigation of invasive species uh, that more and more capacity and tools are coming into the state. And, and we're hopefully gonna be better, better set for, for working on those and, and preventing future incursions. Yeah, and Christy, please jump in on this. Yeah, I, I wanted to chime in on the, the rose ring parakeet uh, because yeah, Tiffany's got a big problem um, uh, that she talked about for Kauai. You know, Oahu's got a huge population of rose green parakeets. I mean, they're all around, you know, my house for sure. Uh, but Maui, there was a recent um, report from the public uh, back in August that there were rose green parakeets in Napili. They had showed up um, in a group at a bird feeder and there was a multi-agency response. One bird was actually captured uh, during that and they're still trying to track down the other ones. So. So therein lies the answer partially um, in that, what can we do about it? Well, we can all work together to monitor for things, to report them when we see them. Uh, and hopefully we, we have the capacity to respond and that's government's responsibility. You know, we've, we've got uh, agencies that are tasked with protecting public trust resources like, like Suzanne's um, agency uh, and, and like Department of Agriculture that um, is charged with with prevention. Um, so so it really is a very large partnership, um, including you know the people that sit in the funny round building um, to to manage the situation. 
You know what I think is interesting uh, when you bring up those parakeets, I was actually at, in a park recently with my kids in Manoa and I saw a bunch of them and my reaction was actually the wrong one. I said, oh kids, look at those beautiful birds because you know they all fly in this in this beautiful formation and, and you're right, there are so many of them all at once that it's kind of stunning when you see them. Um, so part of it is also a matter of public awareness because I mean, if I see a big group like that, am I supposed to call it in? What, what should I do? Obviously on Maui, that was the first sighting so that's obvious, but um, but what happens when you see these in your environment? Yeah, I have to say you had the right reaction. They are beautiful, mm -hmm. and and we can appreciate every living thing, um, and teach our kids to appreciate every living thing. But therein lies the teaching moment. <laughs> As a former teacher, um, you know you can say you know they're beautiful, but here's what's going on with them. Um, they're out of their natural habitat. They're taking food from things that are native to this area that were, um, you know, found their way here or, or have been here for millions of years and we have to leave space for them. And so it's not so much speaking out against one thing, but it's speaking up for those other things that, that are being impacted. So to get to your question, sorry, teacher hat, um, but to get to your question, you know, it, it become aware of, you know, what's, what's present, what, what is of concern and if you're not sure go ahead and report it anyway uh and and what we've done we've done some public awareness surveys and found that people are more if they're not sure of what they're looking at or reporting they're more likely to do it online and there's a way to do that online these days you don't have to you know pick up the phone if you're scared but if you're reluctant to do that you can report it online and and we do have a framework that will get back to people so yes um if you can do a little research see if it's of concern uh and when in doubt report it I want to bring in some of the audience questions. And Suzanne, this was an interesting one for you because this is always a controversial way to manage uh, pests, which Steve says, isn't it time to bring in some of these natural species predators uh, to control these invasive populations biologically? We know that in the past um, we've done this and we've gotten in trouble. So what is the state's sort of stance on bringing in a predator to then handle an invasive species? Yeah, we, we've come so far um, in the last century on, on biocontrol. Uh, the, you know, the old examples of, of the mongoose and the rat, um, you know, that was, that was not even a state-sponsored action. It was, um, and, and now it's so technical. Uh, and the ability that we have, I gotta admire researchers like Michael, um, the ability that we have to, um, to, to, to identify a species, go to where it came from, and see what's going on there. Uh, uh, there's examples of, of you know, Kahili ginger, um, uh, uh, Himalayan ginger, you know, where it comes from. It's there, but it's not, it's not prevalent at all. It doesn't grow in large clumps, and that's because it has critters, pathogens, bugs uh, that naturally grow on it that, that keep it in check. And there's a very, very detailed process um, that you can go through to study those creatures um, and 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 then test them on similar um, or on things that you want to make sure they don't uh, invade in Hawaii. So uh, so you actually go through trials over a, a number of years to to see you know is it is it host specific? Does it just stay on that ginger or or whatever? Or you know does it have a chance to 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 jump? And uh, so we don't want that. And so in that way, you can you can refine what's going to be the most effective and safe. And so that it's very very promising. And so we are actually working hard on developing biocontrol facilities here in Hawaii. I got to tell a little story. I, I had the opportunity uh, some years ago to fly into the uh, Ecuadorian Amazon and the, uh, uh, in a little plane onto a dirt runway and there was this beautiful tree just um, there with a yellow flower on it and I asked um, the guide what it was and he said well that was myconia and I said that doesn't look like myconia to me and I explained what the situation was with myconia in Hawaii invading on you know East Maui, uh, Hamakua and now popping up you know, in a lot of places. And so he went back and he looked at his plant book and he came back and he said, well, there's a hundred species of myconia here, uh, here in this part of the Amazon. And, you know, they weren't taking over. And, um, 
but there are a hundred of them that we don't want here. And so, again, it's the it's the control and also, you know, what what's what's keeping it in check where it's coming from and can we use that here safely? Yeah, Michael, I'd love your thoughts on that as a researcher. What do you think of that kind of method of trying to control an invasive species? Yeah, it's, it's certainly an important tool in the toolbox. It's not always the, the catch-all. It's part of an integrated approach. Um, we do have both at state, federal, and here at UH, uh, several folks that work on biocontrol agents as well. Um, part of the work can be done here and often sometimes more importantly done overseas and we're having collaboration so we don't have to worry about bringing in these things into Hawaii where they, you know, God forbid escape uh, into the environment before they're, they're fairly vetted. Um, so that's where having these collaborations and I know Hawaii Department of Agriculture has collaborations in Southeast Asia, different parts of the world to, to help establish um, and, and screen some of the biocontrol agents that, that could be used in the future here in Hawaii. We've got a variety of questions about all different kinds of things that people are seeing in their neighborhood. So, Christy, I want to bring this one to you. She says, why isn't anything done to control feral cats that endangered ocean species such as monk seals and birds? We've heard a lot about um, the disease that can travel in the feces of these animals and how much they can uh, hurt our already threatened monk seal population. What can be done about these feral cats? Yeah, so that disease that they vector is toxoplasmosis. And, and all the women who have ever had kids have been told about toxoplasmosis. That's how we get time off from cleaning out the cat litter box um, because it can uh, affect uh, people and it can cause sickness in people too. So what can be done about feral cats and that interaction? Um, we as a society have strangely um, moved over the years to control dogs. Uh, when I was a kid, um, dogs used to run around the neighborhood all the time. As a society, we've decided that that's not okay and that dogs have to be kept on a leash and that we have to pick up after dogs and, and that's how we, how we work. When we let them out, we take them to the dog park. We have not moved in a similar direction um, for cats. We've prioritized uh, cats uh, so that they can live anywhere. Um, including these places that endanger species that have um, as much of a right, if not more of a right to live um, freely and without harm. Um, those are the monk seals. Those are, um, you know, species, even birds that, that are affected by feral cats, even without the toxoplasmosis. Um, I don't think we're doing enough about cats. It's a difficult discussion. Um, and one that um, I think we need to prioritize. Um, Suzanne, what are your thoughts on the cat populations that we see? And, 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 you know, she brings up a good point. It's not just the monk seal. It is also a lot of native birds that are uh, affected yeah. by this. It, it, it's, it's native birds. It's, uh, it's, it's forest birds, seabirds, shorebirds. It's marine mammals of all kinds, monk seals, dolphins. And, and others, and so it is. It is a very, very serious issue. And and Christie's right. We need to uh, grow as a society to, you know, do what the Humane Society says, which is to keep your pets indoors, and uh, do not release cats outside. Don't feed them outside. Um, you know, take if you if you have a stray cat that you see, take it to the Humane Society, uh, and don't don't. Don't feed it outside either in the forest or in your neighborhood um, because that's part of the problem. It's a it's a it's a pervasive uh, problem of of um, of of the 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 toxoplasmosis getting into uh, even our sewer system and going out into the ocean that way. So we really need to keep cats indoors, love them indoors, feed them indoors, and uh, keep them as indoor pets. I wanna... Can I chime in on that just Please, a little yes. bit more? Sorry, I you know I had I have an indoor cat. And um, I've had to close the door because she will come. She taps on my shoulder, um, reaches up onto my chair, taps on my shoulder when she wants attention. Um, and I love that. But here's why I'm saying this. Um, so I have a feral cat in my neighborhood and it um, pulled off the screen of my house one day and it came in and it actually attacked my cat. Um, I captured that, took it to the Humane Society um, but when I had another one, this is second, this is feral cat number two, that again tried to break into my house, I again called and said, I've got another cat, I need to bring it in. 
they had changed their policy. And now I'm going to make some enemies, I hate to say, but um, they were not willing to take the cat unless I agreed to return it to the environment. And I said, no. So I've now got a feral cat at large in my neighborhood and I have to keep my windows closed. Um, so I think we all need to have some really good discussions and, and talk about um, how we can manage the problem because I think some of us um, are not on the same page. We're all on different pages, I think. I want to get to some of these questions, uh, and I'll, I'll direct these to Tiffany. And these are both because they're both uh, about the parakeets. Uh, Dee says, "I live on a vast navy house, vast navy housing here in Pearl City. What can we in residents do when we see these parakeets?" And then Catherine says, "I see these birds in the Mililani area here on Oahu, and they're both wondering what they should be doing. What have you done with success on Kauai, and what should these folks be doing here on Oahu?" Um, on Kauai, we generally work at um, deterrence for neighborhoods or in residential areas. There's different deterrents that you can use. And then for agricultural, for your lychee trees or your mango trees, um, I don't think there's a lot of predation on those um, fruit trees on Oahu at this point. Maybe it'll eventually get to that point, but I don't think there's as much. I don't know if Christy's shaking her head. Maybe there is. Um, but you have to net the trees, our individual lychee farmers, to deter the birds from ruining their entire tree, the crop from their tree. They have to put a net over every single tree, which is costly and difficult to do. We know how large these lychee trees are. Um, there's other type of deterrents that people have tried. Some are successful, some are not with lasers and different things. Wow, that's interesting. Um, Suzanne, I have a question here. The, the viewer feels that Oahu gets more attention and more resources when it comes to fighting uh, invasive species than other islands. They say, my concern is that the so-called aggressive responses for invasive species have not been backed by actual evidence that this is happening. City, uh, county and state governments drag their feet in responding to these threats on, if it happens on the neighbor islands. However, if threats are recognized on Oahu, then you see tremendous resources immediately mobilized. The koki frog infestation is one example example. The state only has so much resources. Do you, you know, how do you respond to the viewer who says that Oahu gets all the attention? Well, it's, 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 it's a tough situation. It's hard to balance. Uh, and I, you know, I, I know that there are a lot of efforts to uh, apply the very limited resources we have uh, across the board. But yes, it, it's true that especially, you know, when there is an infestation from another island that's coming to a more popular island, populous island, um, there's probably a lot more people paying attention to it. And, um, but it's, it's, it's something that we really need to watch out for because it, it needs to be, all of the islands need to be protected um, from invasive species on other islands and from outside Hawaii. Totally agree with that. Michael, Mike and Palolo, uh, you know, we've been focusing a lot on land, but he has a question about the ocean. He says, are they going to clean up Limu, the Limu problem at Mount Alani Bay again? It's becoming a problem. You talked about um, the work that you're doing to identify microbes, but let's talk a little bit about what's happening in our water systems, um, both fresh and seawater. I think I'm going to have to divert that one to uh, probably some other people on the panel. I'm, I'm more of an egg guy than anything. So, um, <laughs> okay, Christy, we'll let you take this one. Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, you're right. It's tough to keep up with the, the algae problem. Um, Malama Mauna Lua is a great group that is tackling that still. Um, they are using volunteers. So if you're motivated to go and volunteer, um, they're just a short Google away and, and they hold volunteer events. Um, it's a little bit tough. It's been tough through 2020. A lot of groups that, that hold these algae cleanups have had to stop. Um, I think everybody's trying to figure out how to run um, activities safely. Uh, so, so keep watch. I'd say in general, though, for invasive algae, um, you know, some of the ways that we can manage those things uh, besides public is we can balance the herbivores, the plant eaters, um, we have found that uh, the native um, collector urchin, the short-spined urchin, actually does a great job as a lawnmower eating uh, a lot of different uh, non-native algae. So if we were to um, support not taking those herbivores, not just the urchins, but you know some of the surgeon fishes that will feed on the algae as well, if we can balance our take of those natural um, 
uh, predators for those algae, uh, it can help. Otherwise, we don't have a lot of tools. We do have super sucker, which is an underwater vacuum, but we can't use those in all locations. Suzanne, there's three three folks here on the Big Island. They are all asking about koki. Um, Tom says, why are there so many koki frogs around Hilo? Uh, then this caller from Waikoloa says, there are koki frogs there now, but they were not there before. And when she called to report this, she was told it doesn't matter because there are too many of them to do anything about it. And Ian and Captain Cook says, what is the state doing to get rid of the koki frog problem? Uh, we are having sleep deprivation problem. That's from Ian and Captain Cook. Is Hawaii Island basically going to have to learn to live with this past? You know, it's a, it's a terrible situation, and um, it, it's, a, it's a really good example of how important it is to try to keep a handle on things before it spreads. And unfortunately, it has spread pretty widely on Hawaii Island, and it's very hard at this stage without some other, you know, maybe, maybe there's a biocontrol, but um, pretty hard to, uh, to keep it in check in, in all of those locations. I mean, you know, there's a lot of citizen patrols, uh, Koki patrol, um, but, you know, uh, you know, so that's super important to, in your neighborhood, you know, your yard, your, your block, uh, team up and, and try to go out and catch them if you hear them um, before they get so prevalent that you, you're outnumbered. Uh, but it is a very, very challenging situation for sure. And, and Christy, I know before we started, you said that they are here on Oahu too. Yes, um, they have been transported several times to um, off of Hawaii Island. And even though there's mechanisms to, to check at least plants um, moving from Hawaii Island to neighbor islands, um, they do still get through. And so we do have a population um, that the state is trying to get a handle on, uh, but there's so few resources to be able to do this that, um, well, we're, we're trying. Um, and I hate to say, but, you know, on, on the Big Island situation, Chaircase is exactly right. We don't have the tools to be able to eradicate them. And that's the thing about invasive species. Michael, um, once you get it, it's tough. Yeah, Michael, are there biocontrols for, for that particular pest? Because I know this is something that really affects a lot of people who are watching tonight. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, uh, not necessarily in the, in the pipeline or being worked on, but, but there is the potential there. One of the difficulties is it's likely going to be a pathogen more than anything, and, and we have a much more difficult time screaming pathogens um, for pests in Hawaii than we do for, say, parasitoids or other predators. I, I think there's um, insufficient containment facilities here to, to work with pathogens to prevent escapes, and, and I think that's what hinders some of the, the pathogen side of biocontrol that is, is used in other parts of the world. Um, the, 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 the dedicated and, and uh, required facilities for doing that work is, is, is unfortunately not here in Hawaii. Tiffany, have any koki been identified on Kauai? I'm just curious because it's such a lush environment. The, the thinking is that if any got out there, it would be pretty hard to control as well, especially with all those valleys. Yes, actually. Um, we have a breeding population that was rather large and it was eradicated in 2012. Since then, um, we average about 10, let's maybe two to 20 a year introductions. Um, that KISC and in partnership with H2A go out and hand capture and have a rapid response. Because what's really important is the community reporting it. They hear that koki, they know what that call sounds like, they call it in, we can go out there, identify it and hand capture it before it's had a chance to reproduce um, and spread and get to these levels where example on Oahu, it's taking a lot more resources. Going and catching 12 a year takes a lot less money and capacity than it does to um, get rid of an entire breeding population. Christy, one of the things that I know a couple years ago, we were all sort of hands on deck was the uh, coconut rhinoceros beetle. I wonder if you can give us an update on that. We see those plastic um, catch traps, <laughs> Look, searching for the word there. We see those plastic traps hanging on trees. How have efforts been to capture those? Because we know that those can be uh, devastating, obviously, for the tree, kill the tree, and then be very dangerous for the community, not knowing that they have a dead coconut tree in their community and, you know, a little wind can knock it over and, and hurt someone or damage property. 
Yeah, you know, I'm going to def um, send this one over to Michael. He works much more closely with the CRV program. We've got one in our back. You can probably see it over my shoulder there. We're, we're trying to get <laughs> the office here. Uh, yeah, the, the fight against coconut rhinoceros beetle is, 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 uh, it's a, we're at a stalemate, I think, at some extent, where we've made really good gains in some locations, but it is starting to spread through central Oahu, and that is concerning. Uh, once, uh, you know, a lot of people think once it makes it to the North Shore or the Windward side, it's going to be uh, a, a very, much more difficult situation. Um, so, yeah, th this is one of, of concern. Fortunately, it's one of our better funded projects uh, because it is a federal pest of concern. So we've had very good resources coming in. Um, from both USDA, uh, our state agencies, and, and even from uh, the military as well to help with this. So we've really been lucky to get a lot of tools to, to, to help against CRB that will also be useful against future incursions. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're, we're holding steady. We've got a fantastic team working on this. And uh, just, uh, uh, you know, there is reporting lines, both uh, website and phone numbers uh, for people to report. But our, our biggest issue now is that now that the um, beetle has sort of left large landholders and going into residential areas, it becomes a much more complex problem because um, the university is, is, you know, we we are we administer the project, but we are not a regulatory agency. We can only ask for permission to go in and check for mulch piles and breeding sites. Um, so this is where we really need community involvement to, to help move this project along and, and landowner buy-in. And uh, it's it's free. We're, we're basically offering all of our services. Um, so, so yeah, any any community involvement would really help with, and, and preventing this from moving moving further north. Um, because it, it will be a bad situation once it moves uh, onto to wetter parts of the island. You know, you mentioned central Oahu. That's not that far from the North Shore. Um, how did this first get here? If I remember correctly, it was the wheel wells of Plains. Is that correct? And where did it come from? And, and how has the spread been? Yeah, we're, we're you know, there, it's only speculation at this point. Genetics say it comes from a, a, a lineage of coconut rhinoceros beetle that's currently in Guam, Palau, and parts of Taiwan. Um, how it got here is, you know, it's speculation at this point. So, so you know, um, you know, it, it first showed up near the airport, uh, uh, basically, um, uh, at, right on the intersection of the airport and Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, or at least that's where we found the first live ones. There has been record, reported dead ones as well. Um, how it got here is, is, you know, again, that would just be speculation. And is this a problem Can only I, on Oahu? Oh, yes, please, uh, Suzanne, please jump oh, I, on. I just, I just want to add, um, you know, what Michael is saying about, first of all, community, um, the importance of communities, people in homes, in neighborhoods, keeping an eye out for these things and reporting them, especially in the coconut rust, rhinoceros beetle kind of case, or koki or whatever. Um, it, it's, it's so important because, you know, we can't be everywhere. But there's also a really good um, uh, surveillance programs in place around um, around the airports where we're, we're hoping to expand them around harbors harbors too because that's where a lot of the uh, the, the sh shipments come in and um, you know we've got some great new tools um, to map all, all of these kinds of uh, uh, populations and you know be able to see the trends and so I you know just the growth in sort of uh, uh, GPS, GIS mapping tools for all of these invasive species has been hugely important uh, for our ability to really understand um, the spread and try to like sort of surround things and, and, and knock them back. And is the coconut rhinoceros beetle just an issue for Oahu right now or are you seeing it on other islands as well? Currently, just a while. Um, as, as Chair Case mentioned, there is uh, programs at ports of entry, um, so we do have trapping programs there maintained by both state and federal folks uh, to, to look at those. And, and you know, early detection is, is critical. Um, that, that's the most important thing. And now that we have the tools, um, if it was if there was an incursion on another island, um, I, I think we might have a, a good chance of snuffing it out there while we still fight the population on Oahu. As long as that pop as long as it's reported early and that population stays small. Michael, I want to stay with you for a minute and go to another pest, and that's the little fire ants. Um, those obviously uh, can be very painful if you encounter them. We understand that they can also uh, really hurt pets. Uh, what, what, how is the battle on that going? We know that in Waimanalo, and, and that's where we had heard of a lot of them on trees and dropping down. Uh, what can you tell us about the battle against those? Christy, do you want to take that one? I think you'd <laughs> <laughs> like to pass it back off. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so I've been working more with little fire ant teams. So on this is one of those that unfortunately became established on the Big Island. And like the Koki frogs, we didn't have any way to treat them when they were first discovered. So we didn't have any control tools for the Koki frog. It took us years to do that and, and finally have something that was registered and legal. Um, and same thing with the little fire ant. You know, by the time it it we had a tool, it was already over, you know, 40 plus acres in different properties. So fast forward to now, um, pretty widespread on the Big Island, not everywhere though. So um, it's also, uh, we've got almost 20 active sites on Oahu. Seven sites were discovered just in 2020 alone. And some of these locations are, are fairly large, um, several acres. But most of them are, are somewhat small, maybe five or six house lots. And so um, the good news is that people are discovering them somewhat early and reporting them. Uh, and, and we have um, some locations on Maui. Uh, we have some locations. Tiffany, you're, you're dealing with a new one on, on Kauai. Uh, but one thing that we found that's super important is that we ask people once a year to collect ants from their property and turn them in for identification um, because it could be little fire ant, it could be one of the 50 ants that we already have, um, or it could be something new. It could be red imported fire ant, which is also tremendously harmful. Uh, so, so the situation isn't looking good. We don't have the resources to deal with all 20 plus active sites on Oahu. Um, and plus the 20 more sites that are in the monitoring phase, um, but we're trying. Uh, Tiffany, tell us about what the fire ant fight looks like on your island. Um, we have a population that was actually been here since 1999. Um, again, we kept it at bay and kind of cont contained in an area until these proper tools were developed. Once they were developed, we were able to treat the population systematically. And we haven't detected a little fire ant at that population since 2019, which is pretty amazing. Um, we're going on three years now. Um, and then in we have a second population that was covered in 2019, and um, that one was controlled. And we haven't detected a little fire ant there since the beginning of 2020. We have a brand new population. I'm hoping it does the same trend and the treatment will work and we'll, we'll be able to stay in about a year and a half. We haven't detected any more little fire ants. That's the hope. But we are encouraging all, it was found in the agricultural setting. So we're encouraging, encouraging all growers and farmers on the island to test their property, bring in, and we will let them know what kind of little, or what kind of ants they have. And if to catch it early before it starts affecting them and making it difficult for them to harvest their crops, if it happens to be there. Christy, I saw that you wanted yeah. to jump in here. Yeah, I wanted to give um, just kudos to the Hawaii Ant Lab. You know, they, they are a program of the university and they're a gap filler. Um, we're called C gaps because we, we, we look at the gaps and we, we try and help fix them. This is not one of those gaps that we worked on though, um, but the Hawaii didn't have a whole lot of capacity to address invasive ants. Uh, so the university stepped in to house the Hawaii Ant Lab. We have a specialist, um, Dr. Cass Vanderwood, who um, has led this team to developing, registering, uh, control tools and um, ways to deploy them because unlike most ants, these ants like to de to live in trees also. So you can't just throw those ant granules on the ground and, and get all of the ants. You actually have to get into a gel form and get it into the trees where it'll stick. And those ants will um, pick up the bait and take it back to the queen. That's the only way you're going to get rid of that colony is if you get the queen. And so it's been the Hawaii Ant Lab doing this work and providing those tools and guidance that scientific advice um, and, and work uh, with all of the islands and we'd be lost without them. 
I mean, when you think about acres of that, it just sounds so overwhelming to have to actually get into all of those trees. Uh, speaking of trees, Suzanne, I wanted to ask you about rapid ohia death and where we are with that, because that, of course, is such an important plant to our culture uh, and to so much of the identity of the island. So can you tell us uh, what the fight is on, when it comes to rapid ohia death on, on the big island and also on, on all the islands? Sure. Well, as, as, as most people know, the rapid ohia death what we call that now is is uh, is a is a pathogen that was first discovered in on the Big Island, Hawaii Island, in uh, 2014. And you know, for a while, we just we didn't know what was happening. We just uh, people just started noticing the trees were dying, and so it it took um, again a, a group of people just really drilling down um, the USDA, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, uh, folks in Hilo. Uh, did a lot of work, uh, state and federal, and and uh, county and private, um, to to identify them. So now we know we have we have two. We have the uh, Juliohia, um, Ceratocystis Juliohia, which is a a, a canker, and uh, Ceratocystis uh, Leucohia, which is which is a um, which is causes the tree to wilt. And so one, one is faster than the other, but they're both uh, deadly to the trees and. Uh, so we have seen it spread uh, pretty much across Hawaii Island and also uh, uh, pockets now to the other islands. We're, we're trying to, um, you know, keep it from spreading. The most interesting thing um, I, I think we've found, and again, this is, this is mapping, this is surveillance, this is a lot of aerial um, uh, 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 transects, um, uh, high-resolution aer uh, aerial mapping, most interesting is that the fenced, the areas that uh, have been fenced and the uh, hooved animals removed, um, uh, pigs, goats, sheep, deer, uh, cattle, uh, which are the, are the invasive species that we were trying to protect um, the forest from anyway. Where that's happened, uh, the number of trees dying in those fenced areas is, is just a fraction of what's going on outside, so it's just so fascinating to me that uh, you know that that the, the the main tool we have to to protect our forests from these invasive species is also protecting our forests from rapid ohia death, and so that's very very promising. And so we just have to work really hard at um, at fencing and protecting our forests. And has that been identified on all of the islands? Where where are we seeing the rapid ohia death we, now? We, we have we have pockets. Um, we have seen pockets now on, on Maui and, and Oahu and Kauai. So, again, we're we're trying to um, early detect it um, and and try to try to keep it from spreading. Michael, I want to ask you, you know, the, a number of the things that we've talked about um, have really just become issues, you know, sort of in the last decade or so, at least, uh, you know, you think about the coconut rhinoceros beetle, you think about rapid ohia death, some of the things like Tiffany was talking about the parakeets, obviously around since the 1960s, so that's something different. But what do you think is sort of the next pathogen, if you will? What is the next risk to us and, and how do we steel ourselves against it? Of course, I have COVID in my mind, but <laughs> that's a whole nother show. I'm hesitant to say that because when we had the uh, table talk for coconut rhinoceros beetle before it arrived here, uh, within a few months it did show up. So I, you know, we we definitely don't want to jinx ourselves by by speculating on the next one. Um, my my work, one of my biggest worries uh, from the egg sector is one that has just recently showed up in the last year was coffee leaf rust. Um, you know that I put that one in probably my top three of of pests and pathogens of concern for Hawaii. Uh, we, I think you really have to look at what crop, um, uh, or, you know, again, I have an agricultural focus, so I, I worry about what crop. Um, I'm, I'm very worried about a disease that affects banana, um, although we don't have a huge industry anymore, but there is a very bad disease that's pretty much everywhere where banana, in a lot of places where banana is grown, um, but not yet in Hawaii. Um, we're, we're constantly doing surveys to, to monitor and, and make sure it doesn't arrive here. Um, so, so these are things that, fortunately, in the agricultural sector, there, we do have preventative surveys that can be done, and there's several labs, including ours, that do these statewide surveys. Um, they're kind of boring because it's usually negative, but that's also very good as well. Um, but, but yeah, these, these are, there, there's several fed, federal and state pests that, that we are concerned about, 
and and we are doing surveys for those and and in hopes that if, if we, they do show up we will be able to to establish a response in an expedient manner Suzanne, there's a question here. I hear a lack of resources as one of the limiting factors to control invasive species. Has the DLNR applied for grants or funding from the federal government for help? Yes, all, 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 the, all the time we we, uh, we we look for funding in whatever sources. And so, um, you know, Department of Agriculture, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Department of Na National Park Service has helped as, as well um, on the federal side. Um, and you know, we 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 do have a significant um, lack of sufficient resources to tackle all of these. It's it's triage, it's 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 very careful prioritization. It's doing the best you can with with limited resources. You know, Tiffany's got this uh, hot in the field every single day of her life. She's in triage, um, trying to figure out what what the spender day, what this you know what what the crew can should spend their days on. Um, it's it's scary, but I will say you know our best resources is the human resources that the, the teams of people that are working on these things across the board are just astounding at their their dedication, um, their their knowledge, and their you know willingness to just go out and, and just slog it through um, is, is really uh, our our best hope. You know, Tiffany, turning to you for a moment, uh, there's a number of questions here about wild chickens, and we know that that is sort of a notorious issue on your island. Are these considered an invasive species, and, and what is being done to control that pest? Um, so to be an invasive species, not just introduced, it has to have an impact, right? And the wild chickens on Kauai don't have a large impact on a particular sector or community here. So mainly they're being controlled um, on the property owner's level. Okay. It's on a widespread <laughs> control program. It's a pest we see in all the parking lots, right? Um, yes. <laughs> we're, we're almost out of time. Christy, I want to get to a couple more viewer questions. Um, this, this viewer lives in Kaneohe and says, every time I look up at the Ko'olaos, I, all I see are canopies of Albizias fronting the mountains. What's being done to get rid of these species? We know that this was a big problem also. Uh, I believe it was Tropical Storm Isel on Hawaii Island that knocked down so many power lines when those big trees came down. So what's being done about the Albizia trees? Yeah, in a lot of locations, um, we have to try to, well, we have to find a biocontrol for it. They are so widespread and the seed set from a single tree every single year, there's millions of seeds coming out. So um, while on the big island, they are trying to manage the trees along corridors uh, where people have to drive to prevent that emergency situation from having, again, you know, keeping uh, roads and access open. Um, they're, they're using volunteers to go tree to tree to manage it. But at a landscape scale, we're gonna need facilities, biocontrol facilities that are capable of housing an Albizia tree so that we can test um, agents, uh, potential natural enemies um, in a safe situation. And for that, we just need new facilities. We've got just three minutes, but I want to get to each of you, so maybe 30 seconds or so. Uh, Larry is really lighting a match under all of us here. He says, I really like this show, but it seems all I'm hearing is lip service about how to do something about cokey frogs, fire ants, and cats. What can be done to, on our part? You know that word of mouth will make a big difference with eradicating these species, so what can be done as a resident? So I'll, I'll pose the question to all of it, all of you, and Suzanne, I'll start with you. Sure. I mean, again, uh, keep an eye out, uh, report, look it up, use your social media to, to uh, inform everybody you know about uh, something that you're you're concerned about. Um, you know, uh, uh, clean your boots before you go out on, on, on the trail. Um, uh, you know, it's pull, pull plants. Um, and, uh, you know, we can all do things probably every day to, to try to keep these things from spreading. Tiffany? Um, I'll add on to what she said is biosanitation, cleaning your boots, cleaning your tires, cleaning your dog, when you go hiking, cleaning their paws, um, making sure you're removing the um, mud because you can track seeds. You can also track rapid ohia death, inoculum into different areas. You don't know what you can be tracking. So the easiest thing that we can do as individuals is make sure that we clean our gear before going out. And we also clean our cars before driving around or motorcycles and um, dirt bikes. Interesting. Okay, Michael, from you. 
I, I think the same thing, report. Um, you know, we can't see what's in your backyard. So if you find something in your backyard or, or land that you control, you know, let us, let, let call the hotline, let somebody know. And, uh, you know, there's several agencies that can, can help to respond. Okay, and Christy, we'll let you have the last word tonight. I'll provide everybody with that hotline number since they're so eager for it now. It's 643-PEST, 643-7378. And also you can do that online, 643-PEST.org, O-R-G. Okay, fantastic. And, and, and it doesn't matter what you see, um, you know, if, you, if you're not sure, you can still report it. Yeah, I, I'd say that, um, you know, for people that really aren't sure, if you can take a photo with your smartphone, you can you can upload that to the 643pest.org site and get an immediate assessment or as close as humans can get to immediate uh, on whether or not they want you to take a closer look or possibly even get a sample. Okay, fantastic. Well, it's a community problem, and it sounds like there are some community solutions, so we appreciate all of you for joining us tonight. Of course, we do thank our guest, Christy Martin from the Coordinating Group on Alien Pest Species, Tiffany Kayanini, the Project Manager for Kauai Invasive Species Committee, Michael Meltzer, Associate Researcher in Agricultural Security from the University of Hawaii's Department of Plant and Environmental Protection Sciences, and Suzanne Case, Chair of the State of Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources and the co chair of the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. Next week on Insights, an update on the effort to vaccinate Hawaii's residents against COVID 19. How do we stop the surge of infections in our state? Please do join us then. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.